Hello. In this week's episode, we talk to Christian Van Vuren and Craig Rucastle about their new film, Big Deal, which explores the influence of money in politics. We're here with Craig Rucastle, the director of The Big Deal and presenter of Big Deal, Christian Van Vuren. The boys have just produced a fantastic film on political donations and the toxic influence of money in politics. So we're just going to have a chat about that today. I've had the privilege of getting an advanced screening because I say a few things myself as I'm very interested in this, uh, this subject. So, fellas... Well done. Congratulations. It's big deal is, is a really, it's really quite, I think it's going to be quite influential. There's a lot of good stuff in there. Can you tell me, let's just go straight to the guts of it. What's the answer? You've, you've diagnosed the problem really well and you've had a stab at some answers in the thing, but do we have to ban political donations? I reckon the more that we can do that, the better. Um, the more that we can even it up at the moment in Australia, it's just so unbalanced. You know, we've got no caps all over the place. So you can have Clive Palmer come in and chucking in 80 million. It's, you know, it, it's ridiculous. You know, it just totally distorts the system. If you're going to have donations, then you know, as we kind of say in the movie, Christian should be able to give about the same amount as Clive. So I reckon, what, what do you reckon, Christian, where we've got to put it about a thousand bucks maximum? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't, have, I wouldn't have a thousand bucks laying around to give to a party, but <laughs> if I, uh, you know, if I did, I would like to think that that I would be able to, you know, share the same limit as someone who's super, super loaded, and that I think that every citizen in this country should have a a same as same amount of influence over the political system that we're all a part of. Um, and yeah, I, I think we need to do some banning of donations, or at least put some serious caps on them. But we also need to do whatever we can to end the arms race between the two major parties. And if that means uh, putting a limit on the amount of advertising spend come election you know, times, then, then that's something we need to think about uh, because there, there are a whole lot of kind of, I mean, you could call them complexities, but they're relatively simple uh, when you break it down. But there are a whole lot of things that we could be doing to um, improve in this area and to make things more equitable in society. We could also make them live time reporting as well, which would be very oh, simple because, of course, if somebody gives something that 12 months later, you might see the, the quid pro quo. You might see the reason they gave that, but because they're only announced once a year in January, um, you get this ability to be able to game the system on timing as well. But so that's, I mean, that's, that's the simplest one, Michael. That, that is literally, yep. you can do that so easily. I mean, Queensland already have it, that their political donations are put up within seven days. If Queensland can do it, I mean, the old state of Sir Joe Biocopeta said, if they can nail it, I reckon you could probably do it at the federal level. You know, that's where the bar I think, is. I think that's a good way to get uh, to, for journalists and anyone who's curious, the public, to be able to kind of link up the coincidences that happen uh, when big donations are made because there are a lot of coincidences. Mm. And, uh, I mean, look, I would settle... I would love an ICAC, an independent commission against corruption. I would also settle for an independent commission against coincidences. I think that would be uh, pretty handy. Christian, when you were um, when you were on tour doing this thing, producing the the movie, what um, what was the thing that surprised you about donations and money and politics the most? Was there a, was there a light switch moment, a light bulb moment? There are a couple of things. One of them, the first one, would have been that. I kind of thought that this world was from the outside. I assumed this world was quite murky and it was all a bit dodgy and, and corrupt. The, f the first thing I was really surprised by is just how legal it all is and just how easy it is. And in fact, just how much everybody within the system kind of just sees it as part of the system. Like uh, it's just really, you know, politicians, whether they like it or not, um, just feel like, ah, it's just part of the thing that you do. You, you know, you do fun, you, you take care of constituents, you do your job and you raise money, you raise money for the party. And, uh, you know, people within business, it's regular that they're getting calls from people in politics, you know, rounding up donations. Every, it's just, it's just a normal thing that's done. And that was the first thing that took me by surprise, just how normalized this process is. Cause I often think that it's a little bit trickier to kind of undo these things once they're completely normalized, um, be, simply because the people who, play a role in that process can't actually see it as a problem. 
And so that's that that was one thing that really surprised me. And I guess the other thing that was the big light bulb moment for me was that it's actually quite unhelpful to be super cynical and to to kind of go, ah, they're just politicians. They're going to be doing this sort of thing. You know, that I guess that uh, that Russell Brandish kind of approach of, you know, what's the point of voting? What's the point of engaging in this system? It's all sketchy. The, the light bulb moment for me was realizing that that attitude actually helps the powerful win. And that attitude prevents people from engaging in democracy. It prevents people from taking up uh, the fight. It prevents people from actually, you know, using their voice. Um, and I guess the one thing that we all have as our power, which is strength in numbers. And, and um, at the back end of the documentary, we started to actually get a sense of some of the ways in which strength in numbers was winning out over, over big money. Um, so, yeah, I think that was the other thing. Lean in, don't lean away from. And so I noticed that uh, you managed to get a couple of lobbyists actually in human form, physically uh, in front of a camera to to uh, discuss what they, they do for a living. I mean, how many lobbyists did, was this hard to do? You got the guy from, the colourful guy from Newcastle, a property developer. Um, <laughs> I think you had one or two others. I mean, was this was this hard? Did you have many rejections? There were, there were the occasional – actually, there were a lot of people that didn't want to talk about it. And there were actually people who, yeah, they wouldn't talk about certain parts of it because they're still fearful of repercussions. Like if you're somebody who is dealing with government and the political parties, and this is, I think, the interesting part about this, it's probably the part that we didn't explain the best in the show, and that's because people didn't want to talk about it. You get the kind of, oh, this – business approaches government and tries to get this changed. What you don't get as much of is people admitting that the political parties go out and really hassle the businesses as well and, you know, put the hard yard, you know, hard word on them and be like, you know, if you want to get this contract, you better be donating. Um, so, yeah, look, there were definitely a lot of people that didn't want to be on screen, didn't talk about it. Jeff McCloy, who I don't know if you wouldn't call him a lobbyist. I guess he was just, he's a famous donor. Uh, you know, he was really up for a chat. And the funny thing about him is just how he just doesn't see anything wrong with it. Like, he, you know, for him, uh, giving a hundred grand and having a chat with somebody is pretty normal. <laughs> I think well, I guess I'm, that, I mean, guess from an ethical point of view, you would have to say that, I mean, it, it's the politicians that have rules and that have expectations uh, from the community who votes them in. And they're the ones that should be, I mean, if you're in a, a game of sport, it's the referee or the umpire that's meant to be, you know, I mean, you, there's certain expectations of you, but, you know, surely business has to act for its shareholders. It doesn't yeah. have to act for the rest. So so they're doing nothing wrong. And I can see why McCloy would, would take that view. But um, did you get a feeling for um, the actual – mechanics of decision-making, because you spoke to Jackie Lambie, you spoke to a few others, you spoke, of course, to Sam Dastiari, who's trending on Twitter as we speak um, in the Christian Porter matter. Uh, did you get a feeling for who actually, to what extent is the bag man or the bag lady for the party in control of the MPs and the senators? For instance, if you're dealing with, say, liberal policy or Labor policy, uh, what happens if somebody gets it a little bit out of line and starts speaking their mind too much on, let's say, the gas-led transition, which, because of, of course, as you point out, there's enormous uh, donations and enormous, very powerful lobby groups behind the gas industry, which mm -hmm. really gives them, uh, a, you know, a huge say in this country. I mean, if if you're donating to these guys and you're saying, look, you've got to look after this policy or don't bring in a no fracking, uh, a fracking ban or whatever... Then what happens? I mean, do, does who who overrules who in this situation? Is it the party leader? Is it the treasurer? How powerful are the treasurers? Did you did you attempt to talk to the treasurers, the people that actually are in charge of getting the money in and doling it out for campaigning? Well, we spoke to. I mean, to, who, oh. yeah, go go, Christian. I was just going to say to answer one part of that hundred part question. Um, <laughs> there, <laughs> there, I do I do think one of the interesting things. Um, that we discovered was, is actually that in the nuance of this whole dance between all these different people, one of the things that's really interesting and, you know, I found surprising was that fundraisers do actually, if you're a great fundraiser within your party, it actually gives you quite a lot of power within the party. Mm -hmm. um, and that was something, you know, both Craig and I found really interesting mm -hmm. because, um, you know, obviously it's not this overt system where, 
the politicians are kind of saying, and I think you were the first person to tell me this, Michael, actually, in the in the documentary when we we're chatting, was it's not this system where someone outright kind of says, you know, oh, you give us that money and we'll give you this piece of legislation or vice versa. Um, it's this very nuanced dance. But part of what happens is if you become a big fundraiser who gets tapped into lots of funds, you can kind of divvy that out amongst the party. And therefore, you can kind of convince people within the party to to go with you on a particular vote or to take this particular line. And uh, I just think, you know, we're all aware of, I guess, the most basic level of influence that would be wielded by this uh, donations process. And that's that, you know, if you're a business who's able or a lobby group who's able to throw massive donations to the party, then they're going to have to kind of think about you when they're doing their policy making because, you know, a favour is a favour. It's quid pro quo. You think of those quid pro quo, uh, how will you say that? But you think of, you know, even in your own life, if someone does you a favour, you want to do it back. It's kind of, it's a psychological thing. But, um, yeah, one of the things you don't necessarily think about is that influence that happens within the party for big fundraisers. Yeah. And it's it is. All. It's interesting because the from a backbencher perspective, you don't feel like you're dealing with this a lot necessarily. Like you have to raise money, but it's not a huge amount. But it's interesting that we're talking to Turnbull, who was the treasurer of the Liberal Party, and he he said that thing of saying, you know, look, you everyone wants to say we're independent, but if it came push came to shove, you know, and the treasurer of the party is calling you up and saying you've got to meet with this person, got to talk to this person, that has a big bit of an influence. And then you've got the second element, which is what Christian talked about, which is that if you're somebody within the party who's a member who raised a lot of money, you build your own power by donating to the smaller backbenchers. This is how you build your power in the party. Eddie O'B did it. You know, lots of people do it. I've heard a story recently. I can't say who of, you know, somebody who's in a very rich electorate donates to somebody who's a first time member. And then it's like, you know, when they get in, they're like, remember where that money came from. They try and build their internal power that way. So it's a constituency that's built on money. But I think Christian's right. And Sam Bastiari said this, it's a dance, right? No politician wants to accept that they're really affected by this. So that's where lobbying and everything comes in as well, is that the lobbyist's job is to become a mate of somebody. And then to provide them with the arguments that happen to the philosophical arguments that happen to back up their point that's in their, their, their monetary interest. And of course, nobody's willing to sit there and go, look, I'm doing this because we got the hundred grand from the gas company. We're doing this because this very clever argument that was given to me about the future of, you know, gas led recovery in our nation and how many jobs are going to come from and all this kind of stuff. Half of that's bullshit, but it gives that kind of, you know, it makes it seem like, oh, we're not doing this because of the money. And that's a really. But I mean, anyone, dance. yeah, and anyone who's done the most basic sales course knows that the best way to sell something is to become friends with the person you're selling to, uh, and then you know the, the best salesmen around the country will be people who are like I don't sell, mate. I just hang out with my with my customers and my clients, you know. And that this is the thing: these lobbyists, uh, the the ones who are best at it, probably aren't overtly going. Here's what my client wants, and here's what like you know, client. They're just you know leaking bit by bit, just kind of peppering this stuff into conversation uh, as they're hanging out at $10,000 lunches or $100,000 lunches. And that's, that, that's, that's why paid a ticket to. And that's why access is key because what it does is it buys access, which this is what the one thing the parties admit is it buys access, but access is really important. Because well, some of it's even in the boudoir because there's a bunch of uh, lobbyists who are actually partners, wives and husbands. Of um of big bureaucrats and of course uh, politicians oh, yeah. and very notable politicians that I was hoping for their names to suddenly bob up in the middle of the the film, but yeah, yeah. they must have, they must have been shredded onto the old uh, the cutting which, room yeah, floor. Which, well, we just should be talking about because there were some there were some funny examples actually. You know, there were so many examples that did fall on the cutting room floor. Not 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 always for legal reasons, just but there was a very funny example where a. Uh, a very senior minister in Queensland went on a ski trip with uh, somebody who was involved in the consulting industry. And that consultant was, despite the fact that the consultancy got lots of money from the government, the government employed that that consultancy to look into reducing contracts, external contracts. Like you're like, you're literally asking the people you give external contracts to reduce external contracts. Then you're going on a ski trip with them. It's just like, you've got to be bloody joking. It's man. close to the bone, very close yeah. to the bone. Just on the Christian uh, Christian Porter Sam Dastiari stuff. Now that you guys are experts in political donations and campaign financing, what what's your view there? Of I mean, Sam Dastiari took um, you know what was it fifteen hundred bucks from a 
a Chinese uh, property developer or something like that. Christian Porter is yet to disclose his million dollars in donations for his legal action against the ABC. Uh, um, you know, without yeah. going to defamation territory here, <laughs> uh, what, what, what's your view? Is Dastiari right? Is there any difference? You know the thing that cracks me up about this, right, is that there's been a huge outrage about this, right, because Christian Porter doesn't know who gave him the money, right? And it, totally and utterly correct is, you know, you can't be accepting large amounts of money from supposedly people you don't know, you know, who, where it came from and whether we're not, he doesn't know, we don't know that. The reality is that what normally happens and what we cover in the documentary is that in an enormous amount of cases, the politician and the, pol the political party know where the money comes from and we and the public don't. And that's the accepted norm, which in many ways is more of an outrage than the Christian Porter example. <laughs> like, you know, this happens all the time, but the public is not in the know. We don't know who's donating to them, but the political party does know who's donating to them. And that shouldn't be the case. So that needs to be fixed straight up front. I mean, the problem to me is all within the system itself. I can't speak for that bloke himself, but the fact that it's even possible for a huge donation to come in with nobody having any idea of where it came from and it, there being that much shadow and shade around where such a giant amount of money can even come from, that is the problem. Like yeah. that's because it's so, it allows for such an easy corruption of that system to on any level if money is coming in that is undisclosed and people don't know where that money came from. Um, yeah. Can't speak for whether they do or don't know, but the fact that it can even be possible is a problem. I mean, I winding back to the to some of what we've been talking about, I'd just like to stress how much this arms race of people involved in this has to do with it because even when we were talking about Jeff McCloy, you know, like the, the reason Jeff McCloy so openly speaks about it is he kind of knows – like, mate, if, if you're a property developer and you're not doing this, you're going to get left behind. Like, if every other property developer in your industry is donating money to parties, you have to donate money to parties. If every other person within your industry has, you know, is giving to a lobby group that's kind of um, investing in donations to parties, you have to be involved in that process. If everybody within your party is raising huge amounts of money and you're some, you know, politician from a an electorate that doesn't have much money, what are you going to do to gain power? You're going to have to try and raise some money. You're going to have to make those relationships. It's all over the board. So you just, in terms of regulations and actually putting some strict rules in place, you've just got to remove the ability for people to do it so that you just take the, the power and the influence away from the arms race itself and you just stop the arms race existing. So, yeah. so it's an, it brings us to an interesting point because there's a defamation action at the moment by New South Wales Deputy Premier and Nationals leader John Barillaro against the YouTuber Jordan Shanks. And what the lawyers are debating there is the nature of corruption. Uh, and and, and the, uh, the plaintiffs are arguing that it's the corruption is not actually wrong. It's not defamatory. We accept now that corruption is part of the system. Have you got I mean, this, this is where you're going on this, isn't it? Yeah, well, it's, that it's so entrenched that now we're, it's, a, it's a slippery slope, a slide down into the, the accepting of previously unacceptable practices. Would you, yeah, what would you say? That's that? the, that's, well, this is the reality. And, and, yeah, this is, I mean, we saw this when um, the Premier of New South Wales was just like, well, that's, you know, she kind of normalised certain things that in the community you probably think were a bit corrupt. And she's just, well, that's how it is. And the thing about this documentary is that we, this is not Four Corners documentary. We don't go and show you this bit of illegality and someone's going to end up in jail. The whole point of this documentary is it's showing you that all of this stuff is happening totally legally. And, you know, when you hear Sam Dastiari just talk about what you can do legally and with such <laughs> shamelessness, you just go, this is not the system I thought was behind my democracy. No, I think that's I why. I honestly reckon I, mm. this stuff happens in inches, right? So, like, I reckon 25 years ago, if you were to just talk to some member of the public 25 years ago, hey, 25 years ago and say, hey, I'll tell you a crazy story So from the future that I'm from. So the government set up a national COVID recovery commission whose job it was to help the country recover from COVID, but they didn't do a single thing about COVID. Uh, all they did was introduce subsidies for the gas industry because a bunch of people within that commission happened to be from the fossil fuel industry. Uh, that someone would go, that's absurd. That's corruption. Like a lot of the things we just accept as kind of norm within our political system now would have been seen as being corruption 25 years ago. It's just that 
it's inch by inch, it has changed and money has become more of a part of the way in which our system runs. Yeah. Um, and I just think that, yeah, that's so it's a really interesting thing, this kind of how do you define corruption and have we just accepted corruption as the norm and is, and is it the norm and are the behaviours that were once considered corrupt now just, you know, the way you run a party? Well, obviously there's still a pejorative um, element to corruption and calling somebody corrupt, even if you even if you take the Gladys Berejiklian position and say, well, it might be corrupt, but it's everyone does it. It's legal, mm. uh, paying to you pay to play. Uh, so, I mean, w- w- where does it go from here if there is no reform? W- w- what's this sort of end game? Have you guys considered that? Well, I mean, it just keeps going. We we want the reform, though, and I think to be honest, the good thing that we're seeing is that there's, you know push coming from the community. There's a lot of kind of members of the public now who are saying, oh, we do want a corruption commission. And I think that we, if we can keep the pressure up on the politicians, it's an area where we could get reform. One thing I'd say about this is it's not like every politician loves this. There's heaps of people who go into politics for the right reasons on all different sides who actually hate this shit. They They would much rather if they didn't have to go out there and schmooze. And I mean, even as as Sam Jastiari says, can you imagine how shit it is sitting there at those fundraising dinners? You know, if you can try and get some of that out of the the system so that it can go back to being, and the crucial thing is having that those politicians are much more linked to their electorates and to the people who are voting for them. If you can get that back into the system, then it solves a lot of the problems. And to be honest, it'll, you know, a lot of politicians would love that as well. So um, I think we can get reform. And I think the public tendency can be like, oh, those people are rotten, like politicians are rotten. Mm. When that's not the case, they're not. They're just doing their jobs. Um, it's Some the system of them are itself. Rotten. Some are rotten. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, <laughs> it's the. We, we'll let Michael reason, name them. The reason we well, can go <laughs> throwing people under a bus in the documentary because we're not trying to say, oh, this is a bad egg and this is a good egg and this is a. We're trying mm. to say these things that are happening are completely legal within our, within the way that the system runs and, and we need to do something about that. To come back to your question, I think it's only a matter of time before there is reform in this area because I think people do give a shit about it. Like the fact that rorts, like the use of the word rorts that just are getting tossed around now for all these different you know, ways in which um, politicians are flinging money to particular electorates that they need to win. For, but look, people hate that. People hate the sound of that. They do care about things like that. Um, tell me, um, uh, how much did end? I mean, the lawyers obviously took the long handle to it. Uh, what, what did you lose? Did you lose a bit? No, look, it wasn't. Um, you were careful, really Craig. Was... A lot of, a lot of, um, a lot of experience at the chaser, mate. Yeah. Yeah. Look, I, I look <clears throat> to be honest. Uh, yeah. I mean, we've, we had a lot of stuff we would have loved to get in there, but it was more a duration thing than a lawyer thing necessarily. Um, uh, yeah, I'm just trying to think. There's nothing specifically. I'm even thinking back to things you said, Michael. There are lots of great bits in your interview, actually. We didn't get in there. Actually, the, the thing I found fascinating, the other aspect of this, which I think would have been really good to get in there, but again, we were kind of focusing on the donations element of that. There are obviously lots of other elements of, of corruption or problems in our political system at the moment. I think one of them was what we talked to you about was media and independent media and that kind of element as well. That was an element I would have loved to have got in there. But, we, you know, you couldn't cover every little shitty part of our democratic system at the moment. And as a matter of fact, as we went, there were more and more of them coming up as well. So it's like we've got to focus on only one shit part of our democratic system at the moment. There'll be plenty of time to deal with all the other different ones at the moment as well. But, you know, it wasn't it wasn't necessarily hacked at too much by the lawyers. Um, but, again, the, the thing I found interesting about it is just that there were bits that we went in search of, and you probably find this all the time, that are still really hidden. You know, there are there are people out there that we know have big influence in our political system that use other methods of influencing it that don't turn up in the in the in the registers that are done behind closed doors and that kind of stuff. That was probably the hardest part. Well, the big four, I don't think, regard themselves as being consultants, and they get more government contracts than anybody, and have global influence in yeah. in every uh, in every government but they don't deem themselves to be lobbyists so perhaps i think perhaps mm, that, that's also, one of them yeah i also think michael like as as is proven by our surfing sequence you're a much braver man than i am and uh while you might be fine with calling people out and having uh economic assassins sent after you by different large corporations i was less keen on that part of the whole investigative journalist journey well, you did, 
you did wrap up, uh, Christian, you did wrap up quite, quite nicely, I thought, because it is easy to get fatigued by this weight of money and politics and all the dodgy things that happen because because you do know as you point out that human nature wise they're just it's not a matter of good or evil it's a matter of just more people in a system working in a in a system uh so i I mean you did very well i thought when you did the uplifting thing when you said you know you went and looked at some independent politicians who didn't rely on money to get them in there but relied on community support on grassroots stuff and you gave some glimmers of of hope there for the democratic system um of course the parties have always all always argued that you need to fund campaigning and this is why we have political donations well that, that was in the old days of course when you needed to buy newspaper ads or television ads but now anybody can get on twitter or facebook if you've got something interesting to say or youtube you just put it out over social media at zero cost. Did you reflect on that? The fact that what is the, why do we have this anyway? Yeah. Do we need it now that we have social media and everybody has democratic access to messaging and information? What does that say? I mean, you know, on one level, there's a whole separate documentary on the ways in which uh, social media could be used to kind of manipulate voters and um, especially when it, yeah. when there's a cost involved mm. um, because that has allowed a certain type of targeting and a certain type of focus and controlling of conversation that has never existed across any other platform of media. Mm. But mm. that aside, I mean, I, you know, I think I think one of the big things just, just kind of to trying to take it back to a relatable place you know, say you're a tradie, right? Every most tradies would agree that hazing uh, that hazing their apprentices is a bit of a shit thing. But everyone does it because everyone fucking does it. You know, every other chippy was brought up by a chippy who was hazing them when they were an apprentice. Um, every you know, it's, it happens all over the job site. Everyone just kind of does it because that's what happens. But everyone knows it's a kind of shit thing. I think you know the Me Too movement in America showed how much it was normalised for there to be, you know, dodgy shit happening, um, you know, between, uh, to women within the industry. And it was just normalized. And I think this same thing, this same, this system of money in politics is just a shitty thing that has been completely normalized. Um, that I think people within the system need to kind of address and awaken to and realize that, okay, yeah, this is a problem. We do need to kind of come together to solve it. And as Craig said, and as you've said, a lot of people don't like it. (laughs) Like a lot of politicians don't want it. A lot of business people don't like doing it. Um, and when they when they all kind of accept that it is a problem, that's when they'll start to fix it. I can't yeah. remember if whether or not that answers the question you asked. I just went on a bit of a rant. <laughs> that was good. Good um, little rant. But on, it, it's, it, it is interesting that, like, I think you're right, Michael, that being able to get your message out on social media means it's a lot cheaper. And even if you are saying we need to put some ads on TV, you don't need to put the amount of ads on TV. Like, if it comes, if you basically say, look, we want you to ignore what we've done for the last three years. We want you to listen to these important ads that we've tested and chuck on air constantly over and over again for lots of money, and that's how we decide our democracy. Bullshit. That's absolute bullshit. That's not how it should be. In the United Kingdom, you're not allowed to put adverts on broadcast television on those things. So why do we need it as part of our democracy? It's absolute rubbish. And it's interesting, actually, we didn't get to talk to him because of... um. COVID. But another interesting example is Andrew Wilkie. Andrew Wilkie's got almost the biggest margin in the country. He uses almost no advertising money. What he does is just spends most of his money on looking after his constituents, on being in contact with them over the years where he's in government. And by come election time, he doesn't feel like the need to put out a lot of advertising because he's done what a bloody local member should do. And that is look after your constituents. Hmm. And if we went to a system where you go, you don't have to rely so much on big adverts running at at election time, it means you're more forced back to being in touch with your constituents over that time. And that's exactly what we want to do. So I reckon getting rid of that advertising, not only does it free up our televisions from terrible advertising, not only do we get less abuse of advertising laws that in the political case don't even require you to be truthful, it actually forces you to go, well, then how do we get elected? You go, oh. I've got to be a good local member and that will make a better political system. The other thing is it's crazy because they really clearly know it's a problem. And, and the way that they know it's a problem is they bought in public funding 
to take the influence out of the money that was coming into the parties from lobby groups and and uh, corporates and you know all the rest of it. Um, they bought in this public funding to take some of that influence of that money away. But instead of stopping the the outside money coming in, they just added it to the pool of public funding. Um, and so it did. It had no it had no effect on actually removing the influence of that money. So I think that the fact that that step was taken from within government to do that shows you that that people at the time were kind of going like, oh, this is becoming a problem. We need to deal with that problem. Um, the problem is that they just added more money to the pool without, you know, getting rid of the outside money. Absolutely. And and uh, in New South Wales too, they, they tried to reform in New South Wales, take property developers out of the donations picture. And of course, they just backslid straight back into this thing again, because in the end, it's kind of like, it's a gravity thing, isn't it, with money? The more money there is, eventually they'll find a way around it. They'll have their lawyers working on the loopholes. The sheer weight of money will get there somewhere. Did you... Well, they, did, they didn't, by the way, just in, in terms of that, the thing with property developers is good and bad, because it went to the high court our mate Jeff McCloy who's in the mo- in the movie took it to the high court and he lost and they actually said the New South Wales legislation is good is totally fine it's within free speech rights you can restrict property developers from donating because it's for the good of democracy that's basically what the court found right and then at the federal level labor and liberal got together to pass a specific bit of legislation which would allow them at the federal level to keep getting that money from the property developers. So if they hadn't done that, and if we kept pushing the way we're going, we would have been able to at least get that out of the system. So it's not just down, you know, they intentionally passed legislation to overcome the effect of two high court decisions, which actually restricted uh, money coming from property developers. And well, absolutely. Now, now, um, the other point is that let's say you wanted to get some money from uh, Queensland uh, to the feds or Queensland to WA, uh, is there any, and, and, and conceal things, is there any way, do, do you reckon, to track that? Because then you can say, look, I didn't give money, I'm a New South Wales property developer, I didn't give money to you know, Gladys Berejiklian and John Barillaro, uh, but maybe somebody in WA got it sent in through the WA Liberal Party there or Labor Party, and it made its way via Queensland and Tasmania back to New South Wales. I mean, is there anything to stop that happening? Because companies can loan money to each other, and they do every day. No, no, this is what the the federal legislation has meant that that can happen easily. So let let me put it this way, Michael. Just say that I say to you, um, I want to give you a hundred bucks, Michael West, but I don't want any of that money to go towards your stupid michaelwest.com.au publication. I don't like it. It's too lefty. You know, he's exposing too much stuff. I said, I'm just giving this to you for your food, right? Now, the fact that you can go and spend it on food just frees up another hundred bucks that you can then put into your publication. Mm -hmm. And that's what's basically happening in the system here. I can go, look, I'm a property developer and I'm giving this money solely to the federal party. I don't want to go to New South Wales or Queensland because they've got laws that restrict it. All it does is freeze up another hundred bucks that can go into the other system. So it's a totally bullshit system at the moment. And again, the politicians have passed the exceptions themselves. They're given the ability to get this money. So... We've, got, we've only got a couple of minutes left, guys. So just quickly, um, how can people see the movie? Where do they go? The best thing to do is to go to makeitabigdeal.org um, where you will find out all the info about the movie. And um, there you can also join up uh, to join the anti-lobbying lobby, which we've set up. Um, seem to be the only practical way to be able to fight lobbying is do it via a lobby because, uh, you know, pollies listen to them. Um, so that, that'd be where to go if you want to find out more about the movie. And what can people do generally to have a bigger voice in politics and stop money deciding their policies? Well, I reckon, how's ha- your local politician about this? Tell them it's an important issue to you. Tell them you don't want to get this kind of stuff out there. Ask them what they're doing because that's the, always, that's always the awkward question for them. Well, do you accept money from... Big donors, do you reckon there should be a limit to this? Hassle them. But then there's also lots of other, get involved in community groups, get involved in get involved in politics. Like, to be honest, you don't have to get involved in an independent group, although there's lots of great ones out there. If you get involved, if you, if you give a shit about this and you go, oh, but I'm a Labor man or I'm a Liberal man, get involved in that party because at the moment they've got nobody in there who's actually grassroots, who's actually telling them what to do. And that just leaves and means the voice that's been heard are the donors, are the big donors. So, you know, just get involved in some way. 
Brilliant. All right. Well, I think we're at the threshold. Christian, you've got to go. Sorry. Yeah, my grandfather, oh, my wife's father is uh, yeah, staring at me with the kids waving because he wants mate. to get out of here and have a, have a cold beer, I think. Out you yeah. go, mate. Thanks very much for your time. See you, mate. Thanks. And you, and you Thank too, you Craig. And uh, sure. good luck with the movie. Thanks, Michael. Thanks for being involved in it. Uh, you know, as I said, you, you, you've got some choice bits in the movie, although there was still a lot of stuff we could have put extra in there. Well, it has to be a big deal too, mate. Thanks, mate. Good luck with that. Talk soon, mate.